Yeah, hey, so here we are uh, talking about how to affect change in the epistemological wasteland of application security. That's like a really weird title, and the person who wrote that should be, you know, extricated, right? No, uh, 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 rate the session. Um, so, yeah, so this is the, this is the, the talk, and, um, and you're like, wow, I didn't think I was going to hear the word epistemology today. Well, you know. There you go. Um, you can get these slides right now. It will have them with the conferences, uh, but if you want to go to bit.ly slash uh, go to AppSec, um, you can download them, follow along, uh, and that way, or if you want to, or, or you know, save them off or whatever you want to, want to do. Uh, I work at uh, Signal Sciences. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas. I, when I landed here in London, I get in the cab, and we make some small talk, and he's like, oh, you're from Texas? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, from Texas. He's like, do you have a gun? And I'm like, <laughs> Well, like, not on me, you know, like, and when you're in Texas, sir, you don't ask people if they have a gun. That's their first uh, rule there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and uh, working on, work on Gauntlet uh, and the hands-on Gauntlet book, uh, work out with DevOps Days and, and, uh, uh, and LastCon, like uh, Josh mentioned. Uh, quick uh, word from, from uh, what would I do, like, for my day job at Signal Sciences. We work, we're in application security monitoring instrumentation. Uh, product uh, we like to think of it as application security you can use uh, an approach that integrates both uh, well into DevOps types and organizations and a lot of the the core team uh, there uh, previously came from Etsy and we're productizing a lot of work that's going on there um, and if you're interested in that at all signalsciences.com and I'll mention a little bit more about that later on um, so uh, I know it's the afternoon I know it's like uh, a little bit uh, rainy outside maybe you're feeling a little sleepy all right, let's just like get to the summary up front, and then you can just like kick back and take a nap or whatever if you want. So, uh, you know, software development uh, has has been a, in a constant experiment in how we know anything. Uh, our application security, uh, we've we've abdicated responsibility um, and effectively abdicated development responsibility uh, through incoherent philosophical approaches and fostering uh, organizational silos. Uh, but DevOps is here to stay, and security can uh, choose to get on the boat for that. Um, Ops has found a way to add value, security can too, and there are some ways we can add value at development and deploy and runtime. We'll have some practical uh, ideas on how you, can, how you can do that going forward. Um, so uh, so this, is, this talk could also be titled, like, how do we know anything in application security? And like, this, the spoiler is like, we don't actually know anything. Um, so uh, let's start out with uh, what, what, we're actually, what I'm actually trying to posit here is the epistemological problem of a, uh, software development, and I know you're again impressed that I was able to pronounce that word. I practiced it a lot. Okay, uh, we 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 as, as humans, like we optimize for the probable, and like we're trying trying to solve problems. We that's that's uh, how we we think. Like what what's actually going to happen? And we do so with things like unit testing and integration testing, and we end up with like happy path engineering, like the, the optimal flow through our through our code. Um, then we uh, we also take that other uh, thing. We, we say let's let's optimize for uh, all the possible scenarios. And this often gets uh, uh, spoken of as like over engineering, um, and, and it, it can end up being that scaling algorithm uh, that you never that you spent like week writing, but you never actually used because you know uh, your, your product didn't take off or whatever. Um, and there is actually really, really too much to choose from in the realm of the possible. Um, so we really just optimize for what we see as the perceived probable. Um, and and how do we know uh, how do we know what to create? And that's like our real problem that we face. And so. We are continually kind of going down that path through an experimental uh, f uh, way, and that's the epistemological problem of software development. Nailed it the second time, so hopefully we'll, we'll see if we keep uh, saying that. All right. Um, and we like to gather rhetoric to support our, support our theories, support our ideas. Um, and we've already, t uh, it's like, well, we've already talked about Agile and, and, um, uh, and DevOps and uh, continuous delivery all through. So I'm going to try to kind of cruise through these slides real quick. But, uh, I think we can look at three major arcs in, in software development. Um, and you look at Agile, Agile sort of avoids the problem. It's like, we, we have no idea what we are building, you know? Uh, it's like, and that's okay, because what we're going to do is we're just going to ship it, you know, every week, every day, whatever it is. And, um, and we, we have behavior-driven development, um, which is, you know, Agile plus feedback. Um, and Dan, Dan really uh, has a great uh, quote here. He, he actually says, you know, we're building software 
that matters. And that's the, the really big uh, point behind all of this. And we're trying to amplify the feedback loop. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, there's also funny uh, pictures uh, in here because uh, it's like dedicated to uh, Sky Mall. I was really sad when they went out of business. And so it's like, what are those products that's like you always, you just like you're in the, 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 the flight and you're like, oh, man, somebody's going to buy one of those someday, you know. But I guess not enough people did, so, so therefore. But um, I don't, did anybody buy one of these? I don't know. Seems like it'd be comfy, all right. Um, well, Agile emphasizes feedback to developers um, from their overlord managers and um, sometimes uh, even their customers. Um, but you know, really the, the, the short end of it is that rapid iterations win. And we can never really overstate the, like, how important Agile is kind of in the whole progression of, of all this. I mean, these should have sold, right? <laughs> like, I would have guessed like, this would be flying off the, the, the shelf. Okay. Uh, yeah, but, but you know, the, the world has changed uh, even since then. We don't sell CDs anymore. We talked about some of that this morning, but we have software as a service is kind of a key uh, factor here. Um, and we've, we've really had a complete change in the way we uh, deliver software, um, the way we distribute it, uh, our revenue, revenue models, and uh, along came DevOps. Um, the ink wore off after like a couple days, so it was really worth it. Um, okay. No, no, I didn't. I didn't really. I just found it on the internet. Um, some people are like that guy. He, he wrote it on his hands. All right. Uh, yeah. So uh, DevOps is the uh, application of agile methodology to system administration, um, and I think that's that's really becoming kind of the pervasive view of like as we're continuing to move agile outwards. Like that's that's how DevOps works. Uh, you may also think this is how DevOps looks, um, which I think is you know also kind of a fair assessment. Um, people call it agile infrastructure. We, we've talked about this earlier today, but t the 10 deploys to t a day thing was a really uh, you know, pivotal point in the movement. Um, we're focusing on less work in progress, less technical debt. Um, customers are actually using the feature while the developer is working on it. All, the, all this sort of stuff is really where, you know, this is some of the stuff we've already talked about uh, all day long, right? So, but we're producing uh, happier developers. Um, we're kind of breaking down that wall of confusion. Um, we are kind of avoiding this, the, the traditional DevOps, you know, relationship. Um, and, and DevOps realized that uh, ops didn't know what, what devs know and, and vice versa to that. Um, and in most organizations, you know, pre 2009, 2010, when DevOps was like started, started uh, moving, um, a lot of dev to ops ratios were like 10 to one, um, if that. Does that sound about like right? Did you guys have you know, like 10 developers to one operations, more or less? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, so it was kind of a, it was a breakthrough. We're saying now we're gonna join people, you know, maybe a different type ratio, different type team structure, but we're gonna join around actually solving a, a common problem instead of uh, kind of the org organizational hierarchy. Um, we need to think about how culture is, uh, is quite important for us. Um, Patrick Dubois, the guy who coined the term DevOps and is like the, the, the godfather of DevOps is, uh, you know, culture is the most important aspect to DevOps, succeeding in the enterprise. Um, he actually did a, uh, uh, like a, a journal um, uh, in, uh, was it the Cutter IT journal, uh, a couple, uh, maybe like four years ago. But it was like how you can actually get all these DevOps principles that at the time everybody said was just for startups, like to actually invade in the enterprise and like work in the enterprise. Like here we are today, like we're seeing kind of the fruit of that as uh, we're going forward. Um, and, and it is really important for us to think about how we actually shift our culture, and we've talked about that. Um, I, I have a little uh, three-year-old, and, uh, and she's, really, uh, she's really into the moon. And like, I think that we have a moon culture in our family. It's not like very spiritual like that. It's more like, it's like she sees it, she wants to go outside and see it. You know, uh, we talk about it. And then like, I've realigned my culture to her, right? So I have a little app on my phone, and so I can be like, Oh yeah, it's a uh, waning crescent moon today, and it's 47% illuminated. You know, and like she's three. What does she know, right? But I, and then I can tell her like we're probably not going to see the moon tonight, you know, or, or whatever, right? So I can I can like make predictions about it, and I can start speaking her language. And we started sharing. We had like a mutual understanding. Oh, and I, I also found out like now I'm like visibly excited when I see the moon. I'm like that's the moon. That's so great. And then it's like why? Because like that's that's like infected uh, the way that I, I view uh, the world now, right? So we have a mutual understanding, we have shared language, shared views, collaborative tooling. Um, this doesn't mean like, you know, we have beer Fridays or whatever, like beer Fridays are great, but that's not what a culture change uh, really is indicative of. Um, so uh, Tom Limoncelli uh, 
wrote this uh, in, his, in his recent book that uh, DevOps is an inevitable result of needing to do efficient operations in distributed computing and cloud environment. Um, I think this is right on, like the cloud is kind of a forcing function as we're moving forward uh, with uh, DevOps. And, uh, you know, uh, Nicole is here and already, already kind of uh, said this, but, you know, basically, I mean, you can just like read the, the, the big points here, like orders of magnitude better is, is where DevOps has taken us. Uh, we, we think about culture, automation, measurement sharing, uh, Bacha, Bacha Galoop and uh, Damon uh, Edwards uh, said that. And we've, we've already started to like identify patterns in, in organizations where like, uh, you know, how you, how you don't do this and like your, your next steps like shouldn't be this approach. Um, and just to, like one last thing on culture, because I always feel like we, we, we get really uh, stuck in the tooling, we really get stuck in like our deploy pipelines and all that stuff, and we don't really think back to like uh, really how important like the cultural piece really, really is to us. Um, so I don't know, some people would maybe say that this isn't a third arc or it's a continuation. I don't know, these are all just like kind of hand wavy in, in the way I view it. Uh, but I'd say continuous delivery uh, is sort of that next wave. You see a lot of people speak uh, uh, speak about it differently. Like you've seen the conversation shift around this around this topic. Um, it's not merely how often uh, you deliver, but how little you can deliver at a time. We start thinking through the idea of lean, like small batch sizes, um, and we, we have this uh, we have these delivery pipelines, and uh, we have uh, a small batch size. And a lot of people will not like this because uh, it's starting giving control to the developers to push code and. You know, separation of duties is, is no good. And I think we should start a, a go-to, you know, go-to is considered harmful, right? So separation of duties is considered harmful is, uh, I think, the new thing we need to go to, go to market with. Um, there's all the, all the actual, like, uh, compliance documentation doesn't really necessitate separation of duties the way that we've interpreted, interpreted them in most organizations. And that's kind of been a, a, major, uh, uh, a major failure. So really, you need to give developers... Uh, power to do their own deploy, reduce code latency, increase velocity. Uh, okay, so we have three arcs, but like I really see like the next piece that's like coming in over the next five years, like that's coming into the fold, is is security or uh, really rugged. So, um, all right, so this is a, a poll. Uh, have have you guys ever heard a security person ever say those those stupid developers? Okay, all right. Um, has anybody had anybody said anything like this to them? Like, uh, security prefers a system powered off and unplugged. Have you guys ever said that to a, yeah. You know, and, and you know, like, both are really demeaning statements, right? Like, uh, I remember whenever I, I uh, joined a team and, and uh, this, uh, somebody told this to me and I was like, I'm not like an idiot, right? Like, yeah, I like security, but like, we gotta like make money. You can't just like unplug everything, right? And uh, um, and I think both sides kind of like kind of are, are speaking language that uh, is, is sort of uh, you know rude to each other, right? And so this this creates a cultural unrest in the organization. Um, we have a compliance-driven culture, um, and I'd like to read this quote here. So, risk assessment introduces a dangerous fallacy that structured inadequacy is almost as good as adequacy, and that underfunded security efforts plus risk management are about as good as properly funded security work. Does that, does that bother anybody? Nobody? Oh, man. Doesn't it make you a little bit depressed? That, like, they, people want to replace actual security engineering work with, uh, um, you know, risk management and um, audit and uh, basically actuarial uh, approaches to doing that? Does that bother you? Now that, now that I say it in that way, is that... <laughs> Okay. Yeah, like because it's no good. You're like that's ridiculous. And in this book, it's 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 a it's a, a book about uh, securing modern uh, web applications. But the first chapter is worth the the whole thing, uh, the whole price of the book because he walks through uh, security engineering all the way back to the six from the '60s all the way to today, and like how you know in the '60s and the '70s there's a lot of like crypto, a lot of work going on in that uh, that space, and then engineering kind of took a a dive and actuarial. Uh, methods sort of like skyrocketed in the 90s, and um, and it's it's really uh, really quite interesting. Well, I think the security is where ops was five years ago, and um, unlike Nicole, my stats are like completely made up, but I think they are completely real. Um, in the in the world of uh, orders of magnitude, right? Does anybody say like hasn't seen this pattern in organizations? If you're lucky. Yeah, I mean maybe you got the one, right? I mean, but usually you have about like a hundred or so developers to to 10 operations to like, you know, one security or half or the place, you know, one of the, some of the places I've worked before, it's like 300 developers to, 
to 10 to 1 or something. But so it's like orders of magnitude type thinking. But you can see there's definitely a, a, an inequitable distribution there. Um, and I think that it's because the understaffing thinks that, um, means that no one thinks that uh, security can help the business win. Um, you know, Dev, DevOps changed that for operations for the 10 to 1 uh, bit. And, but I, I think that that's like, we know that people actually do care about resiliency. Netflix showed that. Um, I, I live in Texas, and, uh, and you, when you go to the aisle in the grocery store to buy um, uh, little plastic bags, there's like Ziploc and all this stuff, and there's like this house brand for the grocery store, and it's called Texas Tough. And you're like, I want the Texas Tough bags, because like, I, if I don't get them, like it's just going to leak all over the floor or whatever it is, right? It's like I, I can't pack my kid's lunch in a, in a non-Texas Tough uh, bag. I also think Texans are a little crazy, right? Because like... Yeah. Oh, oh, no. Yeah. You could probably, it's, it's that tough. You could use it for pants if you wanted to, right? Uh, all right. Um, and, and it starts speaking to like those, those innate desires that we all have. Um, and I think that's what the rugged software movement uh, really speaks to. Um, and, and what rugged DevOps is really uh, speaking to as well. There's a couple videos in here that if you click in the links, um, you'll get it. Um, there's a, a, a talk by Twitter uh, at AppSec USA a few years ago that was really great on how they did a lot of integration here. Uh, Zane Lackey over at Etsy uh, at Velocity. Um, security's for ways forward is to help developers and operations, and I think that's where we need to start. So let's let's review security approach thus far. Okay, here's what here's what security has done. Right, um, here's our, our first bad idea. Okay, applications can't be defended because we had this big movement of like web application firewalls suck. Um, so let's do developer training. So we taught people about like the little gray pop-ups and um, SQL injection, and, and then we, we had um, awareness campaigns um, to help developers you know, understand how to write code more securely. Um, but we actually abandoned knowing anything useful about what was actually going on uh, on the wire with your application. Um, instead, we need to take the approach where we add defense based on behaviors. Um, Okay, bad, bad idea number two. Developers can't figure it out, so let's scan for vulnerabilities instead. Um, and so we, uh, you know, a lot of times a, a pen tester will come to you and like, here's this 400 page PDF, you know, and you're like, oh, what am I gonna do with this? Like, how do I, it's like, it's completely overwhelming and it doesn't actually fit into um, kind of the flow uh, that, that uh, people are used to handling. And even with this emphasis on AppSec training, in practice we made it a, a really a dark art. I mean, like, 400 page PDF basically means like no one's gonna read that. Um, and I've had people tell me before like 400 pages, you're lucky because I've gotten a 2000 page one before. I'm like, wow, like that's, you know, uh, I don't know, I, you should fire that uh, pin tester. All right, um, but you know, integrated rugged testing should sit inside your build pipeline. And I'll, I'll show you a way to do that here in, in a second. Um, we need to, a bad, idea, a bad idea number three is with the new alignment to vulnerability scanning, there's a tendency to fix uh, the low hanging fruit. Um, you can wonder about this. Um, but the, the problem with this, like, it's good to fix stuff, but like, we still actually don't have any idea of what's going on. We don't have any idea what they're attacking. Um, and real threats are going unknown to us. Um, so developers uh, can only fix what like, the attack tooling is actually uh, you know, detecting at, at one certain point in time. And if that's like, uh, separated apart from your um, actual build system, then that's no good. But if you can add application security telemetry um, and things to help clue people in, um, what's traditionally seen as like operational type data, but also like feeding that back to your development side, like that's really helpful. Um, okay, and put, put, then put in tooling that no one outside of uh, security can understand, uh, usually in name of compliance. So we have that whole like get a web app firewall. Uh, this is what PCI uh, tells us to, to do. Um, and this is how web app firewalls generally work. <laughs> And, and, and it ends up being like, and, and usually the, the trick behind web app firewalls is you can choose your own adventure, adventure here. Um, you can choose a possible solution, uh, smallest possible, possible solution. Uh, you can consider a WAF, so you just have a CDN and you like add in the mod security rule set and huzzah, you're good. Or you can um, get an application that blocks all the things and then you're like, but no one hangs out with me. Why? Why? <laughs> and, and like, uh, just from a couple years back, there's a, a white paper that was released on this, and it said, every aspect of managing WAFs is an ongoing process. This is the antithesis of set it and forget it technology. Uh, that is the real point of this research. To maximize value from your WAF, you need to go 
in with everyone's eyes open to the effect required to get you uh, effect, effort required to get and keep the WAF running productively. I mean, you're, you're like falling asleep for that. You're like, what is this? Like, um, and it's, it's like, that's just completely crazy. Like we cannot do that. Uh, you know, that's not good. So we have to change and security has to add value. So, okay, how do we actually do that? Let's stop with all like the bad problems and let's actually offer some solution. Um, two ways, we need to add value to the devs, we need to add value to the operations. Um, and we need to hope that like someone in the organization actually cares about it. Okay, here's tip one. Uh, automate security tooling to run, um, uh, run in testing. Um, so we were talking about Gauntlet earlier. Um, so, so you can start with one test for cross-site scripting on just a few pages of your app. Uh, uh, the Gauntlet uh, tool will help you do that and help you automate that. And uh, let's see. So uh, just a, a quick thing about Gauntlet. It's MIT licensed. Uh, comes with pre-scanned uh, steps that hook into your security testing uh, tools. Um, it doesn't do any installation of tools. It's not like a package manager or anything like that. Uh, but it wants to be part of the continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. Uh, and it's a good citizen of standard air, standard out. Um, it's built on top of Cucumber, um, so it kind of works like this. You put your code in, right, and like different security tools that you've rigged in uh, will attack it, and if it comes out the other end, then it, it works, uh, uh, then it passes the test. Uh, Gauntlet is pretty simple. It works with just plain text files uh, that are attack files, and it, when you say run Gauntlet, it just looks at its directory and all the subdirectories and tries to find anything that's uh, called attack and, and runs that. Um, what does an attack file look like? So. Um, Let's read through this real quick. Um, this is a this is not the best example. For, uh, well, I think we'll have a cross-site scripting one in a second. But this is a end map example, which is not as relevant to application side. But uh, the feature is like an end map attacks, for example, .com. Given we have end map installed at that that uh, that uh, kind of data point, um, when I launch an end map attack with uh, this command, and then the output should contain uh, port 80 is open. And then it should contain that port 25 is not open. The given runs, if you're familiar with cucumbers, like the given runs, then the wind, then, and then the next time uh, on the next scenario, it kind of runs clean. So each one uh, functions independently of each other. Uh, so here's a cross site scripting example. Uh, look for cross site scripting uh, using Arachne against a URL. You feed in the, uh, the URL again. So if you're on a Jenkins box or wherever, wherever you stand up your app and you do your integration testing, you could just plug whatever that uh, is there. And then uh, run Arachne. And then this is that like knowledge inside of the security person's head that's like, uh, you know, we've built up over, over years uh, that's maybe like inside of a bash script or just, you know, they have it in some sort of uh, uh, attacks that they, they normally run. Um, but now it's, now it's in a way that anybody in the organization, developers, operations, security can pick this up and you don't have, really have to know what this means. Like you, you just know like it's going to uh, attack the, uh, attack my stuff, and it's going to look for cross-site scripting, and everything else in the document sort of um, confirms like what it's actually uh, going to do. And then this is the uh, expected output. And the nice thing about it is like as Arachne changes and gets updated, um, and even if your code's not changing, um, it's able to like um, do some some extra testing of your uh, of your uh, of your application, um, even like the stuff that you wouldn't expect for it to find. You can just sort of write that affirmation of like I don't want cross-site scripting ever to be available uh, on this part of my app. Um, uh, yeah, so there is a, there's a whole um, uh, write-up and a, a slide deck with uh, labs. It's like a two-and-a-half-hour uh, thing we did at South by Southwest. And uh, if you got the slides from the beginning or at the end, you can grab it. But um, we walked through, like, how, how to do, uh, do cross-site scripting, SQL injection, how to do, like, regex uh, matching with your output, how to, like, if you maybe want to set it up with... Uh, Inside of your build system, you want to like set up environment variables so Gauntlet knows how to work with all that stuff. Anyways, I didn't want to like take up the whole time of the workshop going through all the Gauntlet switches and, and, and knobs there. Um, but if you want to grab this, like that's a really helpful resource. Um, this uh, Gauntlet demo um, is what's actually used in those those labs. So if you go to that um, on GitHub under the Gauntlet project, um, Gauntlet demo, and it has all the labs broken up step by step. And then if you're, if you're really interested in getting started with it, um, we have a book that's like not um, super well fleshed out yet, but I'm, I'm actually adding in all those labs from those, uh, um, all the labs from, from South by Southwest uh, uh, stuff and putting it into the book. And uh, if you email book at gauntlet.org, um, I'll get you a copy and put you on the review, uh, the review team so you can uh, take a look at it as we're adding in all those labs uh, if you just want to run through that. All right. Um, 
All right, so you can, the other thing uh, that's pretty cool about Gauntlet is it's really good about working inside of a continuous integration system. Um, so if you look at the Gauntlet demo uh, uh, project, um, you'll notice that there's like a Travis uh, badge on there, and we're already, already, we're already sitting in uh, a CI system uh, inside of itself. And so all the labs that we run inside of the, um, uh, this, the, that uh, previous deck that I showed, they're all already integrated, integrated test, uh, CI tested and, and run through here. All right, let's see. Uh, okay, and then here's another talk I did with uh, Gareth, and it's, uh, uh, we also put together a repo, uh, or a, I guess a GitHub organization, a secure pipeline project. Um, and we have examples um, using Gauntlet, using Jenkins, using Travis, using a Python app, using a Ruby on Rails app. Um, and you can check it out, and there's a lot of different ways you can hook um, all sorts of security testing in your uh, build pipeline. Uh, all right, add application security telemetry to devs and operations. Uh, you can do s simple things like convert your app security logs into metrics uh, in this, like that uh, the dev and operations use. So take your log stash uh, stuff and turn them into statsd uh, metrics. You can do runtime correlation between the biz, operations, development, and security. Uh, stuff like uh, SQL injection attempts and HTTP 500s. Like I want to know, uh, I want to alert off where those things are happening. Or are we seeing a login spike and, and transaction decrease? Um, a lot of the stuff is like our, our company is actually working on a lot of this, um, but you can get a, a pretty good way with like going log stash and uh, stats D. Um, okay, another thing that I think is pretty cool that, um, that people are turning on, getting, um, uh, getting this hooked into their, their CI or in their config management stuff is get hugs from the auditors and add ha hardening and audit uh, using config management. Um, I think it's really useful to know like DevOps isn't antithetical to CI or to uh, to audit and compliance. Um, it's just they don't know, like they haven't seen systems built like that. But if you're like, oh, we're, we're testing our hardening on our systems every time we run um, config management, um, uh, you know, I think that's pretty helpful. There is a, uh, there's a project, uh, I think it's link, linked down in the bottom here. Uh, but you can run chef in audit mode just to assert um, that you are actually hardened to the right standards. There's companies that are doing some of this already, like uh, ThreatStack, uh, which does OS and config management. Um, all right, so, you know, we just need to reverse the trend. We need to add value to ops. We need to add value to dev. Um, I think we walked through the, the summary, but we'll go through it one more time just to make sure we, we felt like we covered it all. Uh, software development has been a constant experiment in how we know anything. Uh, we abdicated our runtime responsibility um, and our development responsibility through incoherent philosophical approaches and fostering organizational silos. But DevOps is here. Security can actually be a part of it. It can actually be the next step in it. Um, and ops found a way to add value. Security needs to find a way uh, to, to follow that same path. And there's three ways that we can add value, a development, a deploy, and a runtime. And I think through uh, some of the different approaches um, uh, that we talked about, I think that's pretty helpful. So, all right, thanks.